Hello and welcome back to this absolute beginner's guide to Faria. If you missed the first two parts of this series, be sure to check out the link in the top right corner of this video. Today we're just going to be covering all of the many different game modes that are in Faria. There's single player, multiplayer, and some co-op options as well. And as always, I'll have timestamps down in the description if you want to jump ahead to a particular section. So when you first press the play button, you'll get presented with these four options. You won't have access to Pandora or puzzles until you reach level 5. And just to point out, your player level can be seen right up here on the top right. In adventure mode, you face the AI in solo or co-op missions. Really important to note here that in any game mode, including solo missions, it does require an internet connection. All of the AI decisions are calculated on the server side, so there really isn't a whole lot you can do in this game without an internet connection. But having said that, there is a ton of solo content in this game for those who don't like facing other people. There is a level requirement for all of these different modes. The missions, you can start right away after completing the tutorial. Oversky will unlock at level 5. The world boss is level 8, and the dragon's lair level 20. These missions over here will give you some XP and some chest rewards, some battle chests. Just click on a wild mission to unlock it. There are seven missions in each pack that contain unique solo battles against the AI and also some win this turn puzzles. You can have up to three runs going at the same time, and once you complete one of them, you can just open up another like I just did there. The board you play on can sometimes take a different shape and structure from the standard board with the four wells on the sides. So make sure to be aware of what your own Feria wells look like. I just covered how to check these cosmetic items in my last video, so take a quick peek there if you've forgotten. This is helpful to know if you want to play a card like Mystic Beast that has a special ability if played on an enemy well. And sometimes you get access to special treasure cards as well, so this stuff just kind of keeps things interesting. These modes are pretty easy in general, so if you're new to card games or otherwise just looking for an easy mode, this is a great way to start, have some fun, and earn some extra rewards while playing. Oversky is one of the card expansions that was made and is free with the base game. When you beat each of these missions, you'll get full sets of Mythic Oversky cards. And this is also a co-op mode, so you can invite your friends to play with you. I'll be talking about how to add friends later in the video, so feel free to find the timestamp for that in the description if you want to jump ahead to that. If you don't have any friends, don't worry, you can also buddy up with an AI partner. I believe you only have access to Shara and Fogoro to start with, but you can unlock these other guys, such as Cap-10, if you beat his missions. You'll unlock him and other new characters as well once you beat those missions. The board is also slightly different here since you do have an ally. They will all look somewhat the same, but sometimes each player will start off with some pre-built lands, or maybe the wells will be in different locations. There may also be a special rule implemented, such as in Rapala's mission, where all of your creatures attack are equal to their life. Uh, the AI also might have some special other gimmicks or cards to make it a little more, more challenging. Your life total here is shared, so whenever I take damage, my ally also takes the same amount of damage. Everything else is individual though, so you each build your own deck and have separate Faria pools. Some of that information can be viewed by hovering over your ally's orb. There's five sort of different islands to this, so you have five different options to work on simultaneously, but within each island there is this blue dotted line that you have to follow step by step to fight each one until the end. The world bosses are very challenging solo missions, you won't be able to bring friends to these ones. All of these have some sort of special rule to them, and usually you defeat a boss by dropping their life to zero, as always, but there's also these survival missions where you have to 
survive for eight turns in order to get the victory. So these can be super unique as well. And I did say you have to unlock this at level eight, but you only actually unlock the first boss at this point. You'll have to increase your level to fight more of these with the final boss requiring level 100. Some tips to make things easier for some of the harder bosses. Uh, one hit kill combos are always a thought, such as building up a massive possessed Ursus. You can also try to gain massive stats through things such as Gabrian enchant things. There's also Bone Collector, Cypher, Death Touch is pretty nice and efficient with dealing some of the massive creatures that the bosses play. Hard removal like Last Nightmare is really expensive and you want to try to be as efficient as possible to deal with all of the advantages that the AI has. Shara is really good sometimes, uh, especially against some of the bigger things that the bosses use, but some of them do run hard removal things, so she can be tough sometimes, but is an option to have in the back of your mind. The Dragon's Lair is next, and these are daily challenges you can take on that reset at 3 p.m. PST every day. Two of them are always solo missions, and one is always co-op. The co-op mission has to be completed with an actual person, so unlike the Oversky missions, you can't call upon any AI friends here to help you. And the rules for co-op are the same as in the Oversky, so you each share a life total, but you still build your own decks and have your own resources. Each of these also has a special rule to the game. You can see just when you hover, and just like the other solo things, the board and Faria Wells will be slightly different sometimes. These are also quite tough, and you'll most likely have to build a brand new deck each day to fit the specific rule in order to win. And once you beat a dragon, your progress will be tracked over here, giving you card backs, wells, orbs, and avatars once you defeat enough of them. So we'll go back and I'll quickly talk about puzzles first, since this is also exclusively solo content. There are two puzzle packs currently in the game. The core puzzles are part of the base game, and the elements pack is a DLC that has to be purchased separately. All of the puzzles are win this turn, so you'll have to use all of the resources they give you to try and find the lethal. These are super fun, and they also teach you a lot of the mechanics in the game, so they're definitely worth checking out. The elements pack gives you some special rewards, like I mentioned last video, including this exclusive card back. Some of the cards have gone through balance changes, but every puzzle as of February 2021 is still solvable, and there are no random factors to beating these either. They are all solvable 100% of the time. Pandora is Faria's draft mode, if you know that term from other card games. I've made an extensive guide video on this mode that I'll put in the top right corner of this video and in the description as well. But very simply, you have two options, a standard Pandora run or a mythic run. There are no differences in gameplay, just what they cost and the rewards they give will be a little bit different for each one. You can play this just against the AI in single player, but you'll get a lot less rewards for it. And in multiplayer, it's pretty easy to get your value back if you just get one win at least anyways. When you start your run, you'll get shown successive pools of five cards, and you'll have to pick one card each time to add to your deck. And you'll have the chance here to find DLC cards as well, even if you don't own any of the DLC. And to help with a better draft, you'll also be locked out of one of these colors, and you won't see any cards of that color while you're picking. At your 10th, 20th, and 30th cards, you'll get to pick some special treasure cards that you can use at certain points in each match. At the beginning of a match, six Pandora shards get shuffled in each player's deck, and when either you or your opponent draws one of those cards, you collectively add to this meter over here. Once the five shards in total have been drawn, the Pandora opens, giving each player six Faria per turn instead of the usual three, and also one of their treasure cards that they drafted. The other two treasures can then be drawn from the deck as well, and any time that a player draws a treasure, 
the other player also gets to draw one. You can keep going with the same deck until either you win six matches or lose two. And then you can claim your rewards by clicking this button that pops up here and start a new run. You also get some Pandora points when you finish and be ranked on the Pandora ladder, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, you don't have to finish a run in the same sitting, by the way. You can leave this page, go to other modes, and your run will still be saved once you come back here. The standard Pandora runs are probably one of the most efficient ways to build up your card collection because of the rewards that it gives. So I'd recommend always keeping two battle chests on hand. And even if you don't feel like playing Pandora, you might feel like it later. It's also great for learning about the different cards in the game since you're kind of forced to look at them all. Something really useful you can also do is queue for Pandora at the same time you're queuing for battle mode and this helps you find games faster if you don't really care which mode you want to play. So let's take a look at battle mode. This is the standard mode for the game with the standard board, four fairy wells, and everything else. Any decks that you've built will show up here on the left and you can select one you want to play with. By default, the deck you played with in your most recent match will be selected or if you had just clicked the save button on a deck list in the deck building page, that deck will be your default instead. Practice mode puts you against the AI. Unlike the other solo modes in this game, this one is completely fair and gives your opponent the standard three Faria per turn and a deck of 30 regular cards. So because the AI gets no advantages, this is a super easy mode. So you'll probably just use this to test a deck or learn some of the game mechanics maybe. It's good to point out also that Steam achievements cannot be earned in this mode, and I assume other achievements can't be earned here either. You'll have to play on casual or ranked for those. These ones will match you against other human players, casual and ranked and they have a 90 second turn timer implemented to speed things along a little bit. The first turn for each player will be a bit shorter though, since you don't really need 90 seconds to make your first move. Being brand new to the game, I would actually recommend starting off with ranked, because it'll try to pair you with other players of the same rank. If you go into casual, there may be other more experienced players on casual as well, so you want to try and avoid that. In Ranked, you'll start off at rank 25 and have to earn stars to increase your rank. You'll gain one star when you win a match, an additional star if it's your first win of the day, another star if you're on a win streak, and another one if you beat someone who is one sort of tier higher than you. So a tier is every five ranks and each tier gives you a bit of a checkpoint once you reach it. Whenever you lose a match normally, you'll lose one star, potentially decreasing your rank as well, but you also can't drop below a tier that you've reached. So for example, when you make it to rank 20, that's a new tier since it's a multiple of five, and any matches you lose from there will not drop you below rank 20. Once you reach rank one, you'll have a few more stars to earn to push you into god rank. So those ranks you had before were kind of just the qualifying matches to get you here. Once you're in god rank, you'll have this new symbol that looks like this, and you'll be ranked now against all of the other players who have also achieved god rank. You won't be matched against any casual players anymore either. Generally someone who clicks on casual will be paired with other players also on casual, but sometimes you'll go against these qualifying ranks as well. And you can check your ranking from the main page down at the bottom right where it says ladder. So these are all of the god ranks currently. On the first Monday of each month, these ranks will reset and everyone in god rank will be reduced down to rank 10, the non god rank 10. Everyone else on that Monday who hadn't yet reached god rank will still drop down to their next lowest tier. So if you made it to rank 15, you'll be dropped down to rank 20. You'll get some in-game rewards on this reset also, depending on how high you made it, as well as some Feria World Circuit points, which I'm going to be talking about in my next video. These numbers directly beside your name 
are your ELO score, which is what your rank will be based on. ELO is a system used in many competitive games. The system rewards players who beat a really tough opponent in relation to their own ELO score and punishes those who lose to a really weak opponent. So that's sort of the gist of it, but if you want to learn more about this, I'll probably drop the Wikipedia link in the description for that. On the monthly reset, first Monday of the month, everyone's ELO will be set to somewhere around 1500. We haven't been given an exact number, but we've been told it's somewhere around here. You won't be able to view your ELO score until you hit god rank, of course, so it's a little bit difficult to tell. There is also ELO decay that happens. So if you haven't played on the ranked ladder in a week, your ELO will start to drop a little bit and exponentially decay with each week that you miss. So remember to play at least one game per week to prevent this from happening. You can also check your Pandora ranking with this tab. Pandora doesn't use the ELO system to rank the players, but instead uses how many Pandora points that they have earned. And unlike ranked, which shows all of the god ranked players, Pandora will only show the top 64 players. These numbers and letters are people's friend codes, and you'll need a friend code to add anyone as a friend, or even to just chat with anyone in game. You can find your friends list using this button up here, and can also see your own friends code right here. Copy paste it. And the most recent player that you faced in a match will be first on the list as a suggestion. So if you want to add that person, you can click their name, view suggestion, and then add as a friend. You can do a few things with a friend. You can challenge them to a private game, or if they're already in a match, you can select to spectate them, or you can send them a private message. This is currently the only way that you can talk with another player in game. And if this window ever closes, you can quickly open it again by pressing enter. You can also click the player's name in this window if you're talking to more than one person and it'll switch the recipient to that player. And if you want to mute the chat, you can press this do not disturb button. So normally when someone sends a message, this window pops up automatically, but this button will turn that off. And if you want people to stop spectating yourself. You can open up your friends list, click on this cog wheel, and then refuse friend spectate. You can also auto refuse friend requests if you're like a antisocial introvert or something. And there's a button also here to the official Faria Discord, which is a great way to connect with other Faria players. This is probably the most active community resource you can find. There's lots of people here who love helping new players, or people who are looking for help to fight the daily co-op missions, and there's some deck building help here as well, so I'd highly recommend checking that out. I also have my own Discord server for just hanging out, and I upload my different deck guides there and some other information as well, so I'll put links to both of those Discord servers down in the description. Let's go back to the invite to lobby option and take a look. So once you invite, you'll be put into a lobby while you wait for your friend to accept. You can invite more friends to join as spectators as well. And for anyone to accept an invite, your friend will have to open their friends list and click on the name to accept the invite. If this isn't working, be sure to check your settings and tick the enable cross-platform option because the person you're inviting may be playing on another platform. You may have to check this option also if you're doing co-op things as well. So you can change some settings here in the lobby. Seconds per turn adjusts the turn timer, so by default that is 90 seconds. The time bank is usually set to 8 minutes per game if you want to turn this option on. So if you do turn it on, then apart from the turn timer, each player will also get their own overall time bank that ticks down whenever it's their turn. And if the player manages to run this timer down to zero, they lose the entire series. And I say series because you can also select the number of games you want to play. 
So best of one, best of three, five, seven. Uh, so as an example, if I'm playing a best of three, then I'll have a time bank of eight minutes per game. So that means a total time bank of 24 minutes to use shared across all of my matches. And then whoever wins two matches will be shown as the winner. There are two deck formats you can choose as well. Classic is just the regular game where you choose a deck to play, but Crucible is also an option. This is the format that's used in tournaments, so it's really important to know if you're thinking about playing in any. In the Crucible format, each player has to register four different decks. You can have up to 12 of the same cards in one deck as you have in another deck, but no more than that. Once each player has registered their decks, it'll take you to the banning phase. You have two minutes to choose one deck to ban from your opponent. And then you can click the confirm button to lock in that choice. And you'll notice that I can see these four pictures here. So these are the deck covers that my opponent has picked. And they can also see all of mine. I mentioned in my last video how to change the cover of a deck and it becomes especially important in tournaments since you want to try and hide as much information from your opponent as possible. But I'll go over it again super quick just in case you missed it. So let's just go back here. So you'll have to go to your collection, which you can actually do in the selection screen. There's a go to collection option. This will not be here in a tournament, just to warn you. But I'm gonna go to my collection here, click on edit a deck, right click a card that I wanna be the cover, and then select this button here to promote as deck cover. You won't be able to see the names that your opponent has given the decks, so don't worry about changing these, but you will be able to see the average Feria cost to each deck and how many of each color they have in the deck. These numbers represent individual cards, not the entire land cost. So for example, Feed the Forest will only count as one green card in this selection. If there's a dual colored card, it will count towards both colors. And if the card is pure neutral, it'll, of course, show up as a neutral card. Make sure to use this information to your advantage when selecting a deck to ban. Deck bans can have a huge impact on the turnout of a game. Try to predict what decks they're running and ban the one that's most threatening to your lineup. After the banning phase, each player has another minute to choose a deck to start with. If that deck wins, they have to keep using it until it loses. And if a deck loses, that player can't play that deck for the rest of the round and will have to select another one. As I mentioned, this is really important to know for tournaments, and I'll be going in depth in my next video on how to register for tournaments and the whole FWC system. So if you're looking to get competitive, be sure to check that one out. But that's all I've got for today, so I'll see you in the next one.